July in medicine is like New Year's for the rest of the world. It marks the end of the journey for some trainees and the start for many others. I know back when I started my internal medicine residency, I was scared. So today to help you, we're gonna break down all the things I wish I knew on my first day of being a brand new doctor and how to make your life as a resident physician a lot easier. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. In case you're new here, my name is Laksh. I'm a board certified internal medicine physician, currently a cardiology fellow. And today's video is inspired by the timing where we just have tons of new doctors who have just graduated medical school and are starting Starting their new exciting journey as trainees in residency. Today I want to share pretty much what I wish somebody had told me on my first day of residency of things of how to transition from that deer in the headlights scared new doctor to somebody who could just walk into a patient's room with confidence and how to approach the rest of your experience whether it's three years or seven years. And throughout the episode I'll be referring to a few things and I'll put those links down below in the description in case you're interested. So number one is you have to remember that it's a repetition game. The common fear of residency is finally you're having to make decisions, you're having to put orders and medications and lab tests in for patients and you're acting like their actual doctor because you are. But what if you do something wrong or fail to do something that is going to get in the way of taking care of a patient? In reality, when you're first starting in residency, just remember this, that it's going to happen. There's a reason that there's so much hierarchy within medicine. So regardless, if you're a brand new intern and resident, you have upper level residents, you have fellows and you have attendings who are always looking over your decision making and are kind of the extra check mark in case you do something wrong. And so if you can finally get to that place where you can just take a deep breath and saying, I'm learning to be a doctor, then you can flip your mindset and saying every single day I need to focus on reminding myself that this is a repetition game. Each patient that comes in with a similar complaint is an opportunity for you to adjust and improve and tinker your ability of taking care of that problem. Somebody comes in to me as a medicine doctor and is complaining of abdominal pain, they're coming with pancreatitis, initially I may not know everything there is to do. What images do I order? What lab tests do I order? How do I treat them for their discomfort? How long do I expect them to be in the hospital? You're going to have to be able to answer some of those questions questions for your patients. But as you see more and more patients with pancreatitis becomes one of the easiest diagnoses in medicine to do because some of it is very algorithmic. But you have to remind yourself on day one, you probably haven't seen too many of every single problem. Thus, every patient is an opportunity for you to repeat and get a little bit better. As long as you're focused on asking yourself, what type of things that I already know about the situation and what type of things do I now know and need to remember for future patients in similar situations. And this concept of the repetition game happens on even the most microscopic level. For example, you have to get better at understanding what small lab values and abnormalities look like. Best way to do it is every time that you're pre-charting on your patients for the day, let's say you have 10 patients, that's 10 opportunities for you to get a repetition of saying, is that potassium abnormal, normal, or how does it relate to the rest of the patient's care? And each day focusing on looking for patterns that when these electrolytes are up and their creatinine is doing this, this is probably what that means. When I see that their lactate is doing this and the rest of their labs are doing this, this is what I'm concerned about. And so just remember that it is okay to take a deep breath. You will not always know what to do. Rely on your support system, but always focus on every time that you have an opportunity of getting an extra rep that you make the most out of it, of storing that information for the next patient you have. Number two on that note is storing is caring. It makes no sense if you go from patient to patient, situation to situation, or lectures and pearls that are given to you if you do not do a good job of storing that information somewhere. This was personally a regret from my own residency experience because although I had a great training experience, I know I left stuff on the table because I didn't store enough of all the pearls that I got from some of the best of the best in the field. And so for all the trainees out there, whether you're a brand new intern or somebody who's been through your residency program for a few years, highly recommend that if you don't have one, have a digital hub where you can just store all the information that you get throughout the years and so you can easily go back and refer to it. Just to show you my own example, this is something that I've been using for my cardiology fellowship. Anytime that I'm learning something, I'm personally using RemNote to kind of collect all the new trials that I read, anything about specific kind of papers that I'm coming through, or if I have a lecture that I'm given in a new conference and I want to kind of store the main things, then I'll take pictures, I'll go ahead and add little things that the professor or the attending may mention. And then at some point later in the week, usually I'll go back and sort these based off their topics or add tags on what those topics are. So that way, if I wanted to kind of look for everything with that tag, I could easily come back to it. Now, if you're interested, I'm gonna do a full walkthrough of RemNode as well as my second brain method using it in a future video. So if you haven't, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell for future videos, but you don't have to necessarily use RemNode. You can get as simple as using something like Google Drive, or if you're using iOS, using one of their built-in tools, you can use things like Evernote, Notion. There's so many great tools out there, but having a digital way that you can easily take your phone and saying, oh, I learned a little pearl today from a professor, just typing that in really quickly and then storing that wherever you want or organizing it a little bit better is a great way of always kind of storing all the things you're getting makes it very easy to refer and relearn things in the future compared to the situation where I am, where I got a great amount of pearls in residency, 
didn't store them, and there's no real way that I can go back into learning them. It's fortunate loss for me. Tip number three is to make efficiency a game. Now, if you want to be a good resident, especially if you want to be a good intern, you have to master the art of stop being inefficient. So you have to identify all the things that are costing you time. Usually it's a combination of pre-charting, seeing your patients, and writing notes. Those are usually the biggest time suckers throughout the day because once you get through those documentation logistical things of a day, especially if you're an internal medicine residency like me, where you just have to write notes all day and it can become very time cumbersome. But once you master or at least improve your efficiency of some of those time suckers, you become a lot more efficient and open more time to learn medicine, to practice medicine, to practice making decisions for your patients. And residency feels like a lot more in your control compared to situations like when I first started residency, I was writing notes till about 4 to 5 p.m. on a shift that would end at 5.30. And so I had very little time left over in the day to kind of process everything I learned. I felt like I was just documenting from start to finish. Once you find that I'm terrible at pre-charting, I'm terrible at writing notes, I'm terrible at seeing patients in an efficient enough manner, ask yourself, let's pick out of those three things, the thing that is going to cost me the most time. Usually it's note writing or sometimes it's pre-charting, but pick the one that feels like it's the most time intensive for you and ask yourself where the inefficiency come. Maybe when you're writing your notes, you're finding that you're also writing it on a paper for the start of the day. Perhaps it just makes sense to start pre-filling out your note as you're pre-charting and then using that digital version that you're creating as your pre-charting document for rounds. As an example, let's say you're a brand new resident who's struggling writing their notes in time. Perhaps you find out that during the start of the day, you're writing everything on a piece of paper and then you transfer referring it to your notes for your documentation. Maybe you try a version, for example, where you're pre-charting, you just type that into your note and begin to pre-fill them, save them because you haven't finished writing the entire thing. After you see your patient, you write your physical exam and you write your plan. And after you round with your attending, you go ahead and fill out any little details and you sign the note then and there. That's just an example of looking through your daily flow, asking where there's some redundancies, where are things not as fast as they should be, and how could I possibly make that faster? Try the strategy that you think of or that your upper levels are attempting and seeing where the biggest benefit and return on your time comes from, and then double down on the next thing that's slowing you down. This is something personally that I did by accident when I was a resident, but I knew that my first rotation was an ICU rotation where we were easily seeing a lot of patients, especially if you're bringing a brand new doctor. So once I was able to get the efficiency thing, I felt compared to my peers, I was able to actually improve on my medical knowledge just because I had more time to not be writing notes in front of a computer, instead thinking or reading about topics I could better take care of patients. Number four, and this is a personally big one for me, is work working on your bedside patient skills. This sounds like a very cheesy concept, but really one thing that you have to leave hopefully with this episode is that you leave with the patient skills that you build during your training programs. Very rarely have I seen physicians become better at their bedside manner compared to when they leave their training program. That's usually where you have the most amount of time interacting with patients, asking them questions, getting better at your history and your physical exam skills, and more importantly, building the sense of confidence in your patients, especially during difficult conversations. Taking for example, my year as an internal medicine hospitalist where I was attending, you just get so busy. It's very easy to brush off patients' complaints or move very fast just because of all the logistical things you have to do. So if you haven't built the habits of sitting down with patients and talking to them and building that rapport and confidence that they should have in you and vice versa, then often patients will have just kind of a nasty taste in their mouth, especially if you're somebody who seems inconsiderate. It's a hard skill to build later. So building those skills now of understanding how to talk to patients, how to make them comfortable, how to ask them about their lives without causing 10 to 20, 30, extra minute conversations, but really just going into a patient's room and interacting with them. It's just not just their physician to a patient, but person to person. I felt like doing that in residency really allowed me to just interact with all kinds of patients, those tough, difficult patients, as well as those patients that are super pleasant. And having that chameleon ability of just going into a room and creating the sense of confidence, again, the medical knowledge can be built over time, but that rapport skill is really hard if you don't focus on it. So use this three to seven years that you have in residency of going into every room and trying to be the most professional patient rapport kind of doctor that you can be, again, the clinical knowledge will come. But if you're feeling super rushed, where you're not interacting with your patients, you're not being considerate, you're not listening, those are really hard skills to just say when you're finally 10 years out of practice of saying, you should become a better physician by listening to my patient. That skill really doesn't come with time. That ability kind of plateaus and so you have to make it a priority during your training. Because I promise you, the better that you are now of going into a patient's room and leaving with a sense of that patient trusts me, like feeling that is, is truly special. And I can't say enough of how much that's helped me as a physician because sometimes I just don't know the clinically right thing to do, but if that patient trusts me to give me the time to look or ask the right questions or get help from a consultant, then it still builds this nice relationship and you can ultimately take care of a patient much better. So take your time, sit at the bedside, sometimes just sit 
at a chair next to the patient, hold our hands, ask them questions, especially if those patients are really struggling. If you have a patient who is labeled as being difficult, take those as challenges of saying, I'm gonna use this patient to build my skills of patience and listening and seeing how those interactions work. And then using each experience, just like the last one, storing them and asking yourself, how would I interact with a similar patient differently the next time or the same? And doubling down on those, I promise you, you'll walk out of being not just a great clinician, but a great physician that your patients look forward to seeing. Number five is a tip that I promise that if you want to escalate how quickly you are at becoming a good doctor, this is what you should take on. And that is pretending to be the sole decision maker. Early in the episode, we talked about there being so many levels of hierarchy and support, which is a good thing, but at the same time, when you're an intern and you are not quite comfortable making decisions, often it is comfortable knowing that you have so many levels of support that you will fail sometimes to make decisions because you know your upper level resident will make the plan for you, your attending will make the decision that your fellow will help out. But pretend like you're the only decision maker is one of the fastest ways of understanding what did I miss? Because in medicine, for example, let's just go back to our example of treating pancreatitis, or if you're a surgeon, of doing a hernia repair, which is a classic thing that we all do. Often and for even the most simplistic cases, you will have the foundational knowledge, but there will be things that you forget until you put yourself tested to do so. So for example, if you have a patient who comes in with pancreatitis, practice putting in those orders yourself without your upper level thinking about it. Write down everything that you would put down, what antibiotics, what lab tests, what imaging, what type of treatments, how much the fluid should be, how long they should go, what their patient's diet should be, what you think their plan is going to be the next day, and think about all those things. As if, again, if you're the only doctor for that patient for the next five days or however long they're going to be in the hospital, then compare that to what your attendings and your upper levels residents and fellows choose to do. Maybe you're right on the money about everything they want to do. Perfect. Maybe you forget some lab test to order for the next day as a follow-up. That is a learning point. Perhaps you tell them that you want to order an ultrasound, but your attending recommends a CT. Maybe you don't need imaging at all based on how the patient's doing. These are all learning points that you pick up, but you only pick them up to truly stick with you once you get in the habit of saying, I want to make the decision first, then you all tell me where I fell flat or things where I made decisions right on the money. And doing that really helped me escalate my clinical abilities so much faster than my peers because I was okay at looking stupid because you have that benefit of hierarchy saying, I think we should do this. What do you think? And then somebody will tell you, Maybe think about this and ask yourself how the decision making will change. Maybe the patient has kidney problems. You're gonna use a different antibiotic than the one you recommended. All of those little kind of learning points come from being able to have the confidence to make decisions. So pretend like you're the sole decision maker, compare your decisions to the ones that those are above you choose to make, and then continue to practice this, doing the repetition game that we talked about, doing the storing game that we talked about, and the second kind of tip. I promise you, your escalation as a physician is going to increase so much, more importantly, your confidence is going to increase. You go from the stress anxiety doctor to one who feels like they're getting better at medicine every single day. Next up is be an ultimate team player. Residency medicine is truly about just having this phrase that I personally care about, which is how can I help? There are gonna be times where it feels like it's not your job. You're gonna get a consult from a service that you feel like is silly. You're going to get a request from your attendings, from your upper levels that feels like despite how much work you've done, maybe it's not the role for you. Perhaps somebody else should step up and offer to help. But being the ultimate team member, whether it's helping a nurse with something that doesn't seem like it's your job. For example, as a cardiology fellow, I was trying to get somebody to a cath lab. They needed to be timely. The patient needed a blood glucose checked. I worked in a diabetes camp for two summers in med school. I checked it myself. It's not a big deal by any means, but the nurses were impressed that a doctor would go in there and get a lab or a blood glucose test before them because they were busy. Having that ability of saying, let's just figure out the best way that I can play a role in helping the patient. Does this patient need a procedure aligned? Does this patient need labs? Do I need to help my co-residents maybe pre-chart and write a note ahead of time because I don't have very much workload, but I can clearly see that they're getting swamped. Maybe I can help do some research on their patient's condition, give them a little outline so that way when they write their note, they have something to go with. Maybe I can offer to see a patient in regards to my co-residents because again, I'm not busy. Always be a team player because then you get that reputation of like, that person is here to work, that person cares about their patients, their colleagues. And the more you do this, people will constantly label you as a person who's just a great team player for their patients and for their team. And doing this, people will often return the favor and just creates an environment that when you walk in, people know that you're willing to help and ideally people do the same for you. Next is super important to hear because people fail to do so, especially when I was in residency. You can only take care of people if you personally are taken care of. That means taking care of all those wellness check marks that you've learned about that are important, sleep, fitness, eating right, and just your mental health. 
Residency is tough. Residency will take a beating on you. That stress and anxiety of always feeling like you're not good enough, having tough days where you feel like you made mistakes, people are upset at you, that is going to happen. But you need to have your ways of venting and getting support outside of the hospital. You cannot be a 24 seven physician, regardless of how busy your surgery residency may be. And often you may find that your free time in residency is significantly less than medical school, depending on your residency program. And so with that limited time, you have to ask yourself, what are the most important priorities that help me vent and kind of address some of those wellness things? For me, it was often just going for a workout on my days off, going for a run, going for a walk with my wife, or playing some basketball with some co-residents. But having that kind of schedule into a week felt like a check mark saying my fitness is there. The same thing goes for eating and sleeping. Obviously, I'm not gonna lecture you guys on how to do those well, but I recommend on a weekend session, kind of just having a check-in and saying, how's my sleep been? How's my eating been? How has my overall habits and exercise been? and then ask yourself how you would address that the following week. Having that level of balance is gonna be super important because now you're an adult with a real job in training, but your job is hard and that is completely okay. So you need to have those vents and other hobbies to kind of fill in throughout your weeks and months that is going to make the experience just as more fulfilling. And lastly, ups and downs are part of the process. Whether you're going through three years of internal medicine residency or seven years of neurosurgery residency, that time will take forever. You will have rotations that challenge you, clinics that are hard, patients that are difficult, attendings that you just can't bear because they just get on your last nerve. And you will walk out some days saying, am I picking the right path? Is this job really truly what I want? But if you reflect on all the reasons of why you went to medical school in the first place, why you chose the specialty that you ultimately did, and those reasons overall still hold to be true, then understand that that slump that you're in likely is just going to be part of the process. You're gonna have some days where you just absolutely love your job, and some of that will come from using the tips that we talked about, of being more efficient, storing the knowledge, building the confidence in your clinical abilities, being a great team player, getting really good at interacting with your patients, and you go into saying that I have a freaking amazing job where I can help patients, I can take care of people, return them back to their normalcy as best as possible, and come home and get to enjoy all the hobbies that help me be as well as possible. And personally for me, admitting that last part that there are going to be towns, there are going to be days and weeks and months of rotations where you're just not feeling it. That is completely okay. You need to lean more on your support, lean more on your wellness, and ask yourself why you went into medicine and practice all the things that we talked about so far in this episode. And I promise you, you'll have a much more enjoyable experience. So those friends are my biggest tips on how to succeed as a brand new intern or just to succeed in residency, especially if you're a few years years in. If you enjoyed this episode and you want more steps and strategies and kind of the tips on how to get really good at efficiency, note writing, patient presentation, and so much more skills that you need to be a great intern, definitely check out our intern survival guide. It's been checked out by hundreds of students over the past few years on how to go from the stressed out doctor to somebody who just looks like a superstar within a few months. And so if you want to check that out, I'll put that down below in the description. If you have any questions at all about how to just crush it in residency and doing it with less stress, go ahead and add it in the comment section down below and I'll check those and try to get to you as quickly as possible. And if this video helped you out, all that I ask is you take that half second to hit that like button to ideally get this video in front of more students and more future doctors who probably will benefit from this and have a less stressful experience in residency. And if you're interested in getting more tips and tricks to help you succeed on your medical journey, hit that subscribe button notification bell to be notified when more videos like this go live. And if you enjoyed this video, then check out this video right here of how I got into cardiology fellowship, as well as this video right here of my day in the life as a cardiology fellow. As always, my friends, thank you so much for being a part of my journey. Hopefully I was a little help to you guys on yours. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.